next speaker is Eric Schweigert, who leads the Tofino engineering team within Belvin's industrial cybersecurity platform. He'll be presenting, how deep is your deep packet inspection? Let's please welcome Eric. Thanks. It's Eric with a K, actually. There's a little typo in there. So, um, so I've been with, well, Tofino, actually, we started as, as buyer security at the time. Um, so that was back in 2007. So I got to learn a lot, you know, from Eric. Um, and then we changed our name, obviously, to Tofino. And uh, we got bought by Belden in, in 2011. So I managed the software engineering team for Tofino moved down to the US from Canada. Um, so I'm actually the guy that I wrote the Modbus uh, TCP, the UDP enforcer, uh, the OPC module, the Ethernet IP module. So those are the DPAC inspection uh, engines that are actually built into the Tofino itself. So, you know, over the past 10 years, we, you know, I've learned a lot about the industry and, you know, my, my real interest is, you know, DPAC inspection. So um, this is kind of a, a great talk stuff that, uh, that I'm really interested about. So um, the question is, you know, how do we kind of compare, you know, different products? You know, there's a lot of companies out there that produce, you know, deep packet inspection technology, you know, malware detection, that kind of thing. But how do you really compare them? So it's kind of a tough question. So we kind of came up with, you know, sort of the plan of like what I'd like to talk about today. So we have to sort of define these terms, you know, the control plane, data plane. And then what I want to do is, you know, keep in the back of your mind, you know, what does the Modbus protocol look like, like from a Wireshark perspective? You know, how, what is the packet structure like? Um, DNP3 and uh, Ethernet IP specifically, you know, Ethernet IP with SIP, SIP on top of it. And then how do we sort of take everything we know about these protocols and come to some method to compare against them? And, and what do we really care about if you're, if you're trying to actually protect, you know, this industrial control system? So, you know, I like math, so I kind of came up with this, like a, a grading scheme. So going from sort of these qualitative mechanics to some quantitative ways, um, it's kind of easy to compare things uh, with some numbers. Um, and then I've kind of want to outline things that, you know, uh, you can't really just consider right in the engine itself, you know, how usable is it, you know, that kind of that kind of stuff. So first thing, we need to kind of get some idea of terms. So um, so there's the data plane, the control plane. So the data plane traffic is like you're, you know, you're getting processed data, it's stuff that you're, you're monitoring. You know, it's usually controlled by the actual ladder logic. You know, someone's programmed this PLC, it should function this way. It's monitoring some specific valve, some pressure gauge, uh, that kind of stuff. Um, and, you know, typical protocols, you know, Modbus, DNP3, Ethernet IP, anything of Goose, you know, IEC 104. Um, so then you have the, the control plane. So this is the stuff you can do sort of dangerous things with. Um, so you can think of, you know, this is the, the version of control logics running on your, you know, Allen Bradley, Rockwell, PLC. Um, so it's the ability where you can update firmware. You know, this is the stuff that we really care about. So, you know, in Schneider, they've got this vendor-specific, you know, function code 90. It's this Unity programming OFS software. You know, you can think of Rockwell. They've got this PC cubed embedded or CSP v4 for some legacy PLC fives. Um, and in kind of the desktop terms, it's like, oh, you're going to do an update on your Linux kernel. You know, so it's going to affect all the user space processes. You know, maybe they change some system calls. Um, you know, Windows, you do these sort of Windows updates. It's changed your system. You know, service pack one to service pack two, that kind of stuff. So this is the, the updating of the actual operating system sort of firmware that's running in it. So, and unfortunately, you know, a lot of these protocols, you know, Modbus, you know, DNP3, well, there's, you know, some authentication, but, I don't, you know, in brownfield installations, it probably hasn't been used. So there's really no authentication. So I could, you know, go to Shodan, go find some PLCs on the web, connect to them. You know, it's, it's kind of crazy. So we really need some DPAC inspection mechanism to be able to differentiate between these control plane and data plane uh, communications. So let's sort of think of some, some common protocols. So Modbus, Ethernet IP, DNP3. So they all have this, you know, in the Modbus case, you have your MBI header, you know, there's those function codes, specific address ranges, you know, Ethernet IP SIP, you've got your Ethernet IP layer, 
There's the Ethernet IP commands. You know, it was this common packet format. Embedded in that, you have all your, your actual SIP messaging, so you need the object services. So there's these, these fields that are predefined. You know, there's specs for this. You can get the RFC. Um, but what we're thinking about when we're trying to kind of compare these is, well, you know, Modbus, really simple. It's like uh, you know, the RFC is like 100 pages. And you think of Ethernet IP, you're looking at like 1,000, you know, DNP3, 1,200. So the complexity re really varies depending on what protocol you're actually looking at. So, and, you know, speaking to that, the actual complexity of the implementation of your DPAC inspection engine has to be more complex to support the complexity of the protocol itself. Um, so, you know, you think of SIP, you have these multiple service packets. So even portions within the protocol itself become more complex. So in a multiple service packet, you actually have these embedded SIP messages. So you could have, you know, 30 SIP messages within a single TCP frame. You know, how does the PLC deal with this if it doesn't expect this? You know, does it support it? You know, DNP3 has segmentation. So, you know, these are all things to keep in mind when you're thinking about, you know, this product supports it, but what does that really mean? How can you really grade these against each other? So how do we compare? So I've sort of talked, you know, probably in a, in a quick manner <laughs> about the different uh, protocols. So, you know, if you think of one packet format, what does this actually mean? So you have some Modbus frame, it's got, you know, some length field. Um, you know, how do we compare? How do we kind of, you know, take all these disjoint protocols, put them together and think, you know, what do I need to actually protect my PLC? So if you think about you know, a lot of the vulnerabilities that kind of stem from the same kind of things, right? You're looking at, you know, malware, packet fuzzing type things. You know, you're adding two Fs to the end of some packet. You know, what does the PLC really do with this? Or, or the HMI, you know, if you're sending response frames. Um, so if we can, you know, cover to that, that 80 to 90% of vulnerabilities out there, you know, we're looking a lot better than just the PLC with no protection in front of it. Um, so what do, we, what do we really need to do? Um, so this is, my, this is my rant slide, or actually I have two slides about sort of the signature-based approach. So, um, you know, signatures, it's really, you know, in my opinion, kind of the way it works is that, you know, you, to build a signature, the, there has to be this vulnerability already published so you can go back and actually build a signature against it so you can mitigate that attack. So it's really this reactive me mechanism rather than some proactive mechanism. And, you know, with signatures, you can build one that says, you know, I'm going to look at one specific byte. You know, what if, what if the malware has a malware mutation, right? So you're adding extra fields to it. You know, you're changing offset values. Um, so that signature is, you know, no longer good. You have to go, you know, get a database update. Um, so I think, you know, in a lot of cases, the signatures are only as good as what your signature database contains within it. Um, and in addition, you're essentially building a blacklist rather than a whitelist. So, you know, you get the signature database, oh, someone's gonna change, you know, one byte value or maybe one offset. Oh, we need to get a new signature. So it's this sort of constant iterative process where you're just trying to build up this, this big blacklist. So it, it's, not, it's not really practical, you know, in the, in the ICS world, you know, maybe in the IT, um, IT world, it kind of makes more sense. And obviously you don't wanna have an internet connection from your, your plant out to the world to be getting these, these signatures back to your device. Um, so the only place that I really see this maybe being useful is proprietary protocols where you can't get the RFC, you know, hopefully we can do something, maybe you can reverse engineer the protocol a little bit, you know, build up some signature to actually mitigate these attacks. But, you know, if you're going to do something, you're going to write your own deep pack inspection module, you might as well make it the best it can be. So there's, there's obviously better ways to go about doing this. So just in general, you know, depth is more important than breadth because, you know, if you're looking at one packet or one byte in a specific packet, well, you know, are you really supporting that protocol? It, it, it just doesn't really make sense. So we really need to sort of get the, the fluff or the marketing FUD out of there, you know. We support 500 protocols. Well, well, you know, what does that really mean? How deep is it? You know, how secure is your network by using these, you know, signature-based systems? Okay, so moving on to sanity checking. So what I've done is kind of come up with um, specific things to look at, you know, in each, in each product. So sanity checking for me is like, it's kind of the, the gold standard. This is, this is the most important thing. You know, it can help you mitigate, you know, 80 to 90% of those vulnerabilities out there. 
So to build this, what do you need to know? Well, you need to really know the protocol inside and out. You need to get the RFC, you know, you need to understand, you know, if I have some length field and some Ethernet IP frame, you know, what does that mean on a specific SIP service or SIP object or, you know, for a Modbus frame, what does this really mean? So, you know, you're speaking about, you know, goose, you know, there's type length value fields. So you need to be able to, to actually iterate through these frames and actually look at, you know, what it means and what's this action. So unlike some signature-based approach, um, you really need sort of this, this all-knowing, you know, full protocol implementation. Um, and that's what the whole point of sanity checking is. So this is kind of my comparison item number one. Um, so, so if a product is going to claim that it can do sanity checking, that means it has to actually understand the whole protocol. So it's looking at every single frame, it's looking at all the bytes. You know, obviously there's some trade-offs. You don't want to in incur too much latency for things like, you know, goose, you know. Um, so when you're developing these things, and hopefully, you know, companies that are building these things are getting the RFCs, they're really understanding what the protocol means. So I think, so th for me, as far as a grading scheme is concerned, this is like your, your number one comparison item. So then I went to the next thing. Okay, so we talked about this control plane, data plane. How do, how do we actually go about differentiating these? So we need to have the way to say, okay, you know, for Modbus, I'm only gonna allow all the read coils. You know, I'm gonna block read write registers because it has write capabilities. You know, with SIP, maybe because there's vulnerabilities in the TCP IP object, so that's like hex F, F4, F5. You'd want to just block those. You know, once the system's set up, you put your deep pack inspection uh, engine in there, and you're going to block any actions to that because, well, it's set up. You don't want to allow someone to have the ability to change it. So I kind of call this the action filter. So if you have the ability to also, you know, block specific register ranges, well, that's kind of bonus points. So as we're kind of thinking of these qualitative mechanisms, we can put numbers to it um, as I get further on here. So the next thing is, is about state checking of the protocol. So uh, did a response have an initial request? You know, did a request have the specific response? And depending on the protocol, you know, maybe there's like in DNP3's case, you might have these asynchronous uh, events coming back. So if you have some engine in there, it needs to understand this. You know, if you're thinking about like DCE, RPC stuff like OPC, you know, on 135, it has these caller IDs. So a request has a caller ID of one, the response has one. So you need to actually be matching, you know, the request response so that someone can't just be sending a whole slew of these, of these frames um, and maybe exfiltrating data as an example. So I term this uh, state checking. So you're checking the state of, of the protocol itself. So the next thing is about response packet validation. So to what ex extent are you actually looking at these response uh, messages coming back? So this is important because um, you know Adam Crane, Chris Sistrunk published some DNP3 vulnerabilities probably a few years ago. And a lot of them are actually attacks in the response direction against the HMI. So you know, DNP3 is widely used in the power transmission distribution. So they have you know, these substations or outstations sitting miles away from the actual, you know, plant, the plant operators. So if someone were to actually gain physical access to these outstations, they could, you know, modify the PLC, send back invalid data to the plant and, you know, corrupt HMI or feed it false data. And actually the plant's, you know, now down. No one has any idea. So this is, uh, I call response uh, validation. And then there's the vendor specific stuff. So this, I'd kind of mentioned this earlier. So you have these, you know, vendor specific functions like this function code 90 from Schneider. You know, as far as Ethernet IP, they also have their own SIP specific codes, you know, vendor, you know, hex 300. You know, Rockwell has PC cube, CSP v4. So there's all these kind of, you know, unpublished, well published internally, but not published out to the wild. But, you know, for for a DPI engine to really support these things, I think it's important. And you know, if you use these protocols in your network, you, you're probably going to want your DPI engine to actually be able to interpret these these frame types. So then I have this. Um, it's kind of a cool one. Eric Eric Byers and I kind of term this pipeline messages. Um, so we first looked at this in Modbus. So what you could have is, um, you know, if you think of like CPUs, you have your whole you know opco the the, um, the pipeline. So this is the same way. So you have your, you know, a Modbus function code read. 
you pad it with a Modbus function code write, and you can put this in a whole sequence. Or in the case of like Ethernet IP with um, you know these multiple service packets, well you have this lookup table within the frame itself, and then you could just pad you know all these frames in it, you know just hide a read and a write, and then maybe another read, and so on. And you know with DNP3, it'll pad all these DNP3 objects in there. So if your actual engine doesn't iterate through every single object, how can you guarantee that someone hasn't embedded something, you know, within the frames along the way? So that's my uh, comparison item number six. So, you know, there's six items. Obviously, you know, this is just sort of a template. You could expand it as much as you want. You know, it's, re it's really up to you. So we have these qualitative things that I've kind of described. And then I've, you know, this is kind of some fake product, just come up with some specific values. Um, so then you have some, some numbers here. So, on its own, maybe it doesn't make sense, but say you have two products, you kind of go through this, the same scheme, you can actually compare against the two of them. You know, maybe 66%, it's not great, but maybe it's better than the 40% that the other product does, you know, based on how you want to value the product itself. So how do I actually come about these, or how did I come to these values? You know, what really constitutes, you know, a four for sanity checking, or really any, any value for that matter? So this. This is kind of the, the, harder, the harder part because it's a bit subjective. Um, you know, so for me and like how we've kind of implemented things or uh, how i had gone about doing this is, well, heck, I'm gonna do everything, right? You know, it's a thousand pages of a spec. Well, I have to cover it. Otherwise, how do I claim that I actually cover the protocol? You can't, right? So, you know, in this case for sanity checking, you know, a f uh, six would be you cover everything completely. But a four, as you know, for this um, Modbus function code 15, you know, maybe you're only looking at you know two bytes worth, or maybe three bytes, and you say, well, it doesn't really matter. You know, what could someone do with this? Although I don't think that's the greatest approach. Um, but the reality is, you know, when you're developing these things, you know, there's obviously time involved, resources, all that stuff. So, so when you're looking at products, you know, you could come up with specific values for this. And then for the action filter, um, so this is this, the same kind of idea. So I went through the things that I thought were the most important of what a DPI engine should do, and I kind of came up with these, with these values. So in the case of this action filter, so this is like, you know, I'm going to differentiate between control plane and data plane actions. I'm going to drop these specific function codes, type codes, depending on the term is for the protocol. Um, so I think DNP3 is a great example for this because there's so many different things you can filter on. So it has you know, the data link layer, transport layer, application layer. Um, so the application layer has these function, function codes, so like your select, direct, operate, that kind of stuff. And then embedded in the actual the object level, or the DNP3 objects, you, know, you have group number, variation, function code, qualifier code. So if your product can actually allow you to granular, granularly filter on all these things, well then, you know, to me, that's, that's a four. Um, and you know you could expand this sort of grading scheme how you want. You could go to decimals if you want. You know I just chose sort of whole numbers, but you know if it can do pretty much everything, then maybe give it a 3.5. I mean in the end it's really you know the, the customer that you're trying to figure out you know what do I really need here. So then as I was sort of going through this, there's a lot of things that started popping into my mind about doing this. So how do you really gauge depth if, if, you know, like I know in the Tofino's case, well, I've written the code, so I kind of know, you know, how everything is built, but I have no idea how the next vendor has done it. So it's really hard to be getting this information, you know, other than, you know, making your own sort of pen testing tool. You know, these are the things I care about. Put this device in there as a black box and send these packets and try to detect this. Um, Obviously, the numbers are a bit subjective. It's really up to you how you would go about sort of building this. Um, and then also how, how it's actually been built. So, you know, maybe it's a signature-based system. You know, maybe it's a full protocol implementation. Um, you know, maybe there's a proxy involved, or maybe you're feeding data to some other system. So you have to kind of take these things um, into account when you're doing this. Um, and then thinking about protocols, well, maybe some company did a really great job developing some DPI engine for Modbus, but their DPI engine for DNP3 is awful. You know, so you can't just say, well, this product's great, I've looked at one protocol, I'm gonna use three of them. You know, so you have to really you know, take all these, these factors into account. So, and as I mentioned earlier, you know, when I built this, this scheme, it's like, okay, well, 
what does 14 of 21 mean? Is that really good? So you have to kind of compare multiple products. Um, so I think it would make more sense, you know, from a customer's perspective, they would kind of go through these things. Um, so some of the other things that I was kind of thinking about is, you know, we have this DPI engine built, somebody has to actually use it. So if it's not usable to a customer, you know, they're not going to understand, well, this is a Modbus function code 6, it does these specific things, or, you know, this is an Ethernet command, it's send our data, what does it mean? You know, these are things that, you know, probably we take for granted because we're going to spend the time and, and look at this stuff, but the reality is if it's not usable for a customer, it's not usable. Um, and then there's things like, so in the case of, you know, Tofino, we're intrusion prevention. So we're going to drop these frames. Um, we're not going to, you know, we'll alert that kind of stuff. So, you know, is it useful to send these TCP resets to either side, you know, restart the session, you know, generate messages? Does this product do this? Does, you know, this product do this? So these are some things to kind of keep in mind. And then, um, you know, throughput and latency. I didn't even mention this in here. Depending on what protocol you're going to try to actually protect, you know, maybe it, you have these high latency requirements. Maybe it's some proprietary protocol that it really matters, you know, how fast you can be interpreting this data. You, know, you also should think about how many network streams are going through the device. You know, how fast can we do these things? Um, and then, yeah, not all DPI implementations are created equal. So, you know, for one protocol, it might be great. The next protocol, it might not be so great. So this is my plug. So obviously, Tofino's kind of my baby. So, uh, <laughs> so essentially, this is a uh, you know industrial uh, security appliance. It was built always for the ICS world. We didn't come from the IT world and move into the ICS. You know, security was always something that has always been you know on the forefront. Um, so we have this idea of these loadable security modules. So if you bought the product, you're only going to you know use specific protocols that you care about. Um, so just as an aside, so for this DNP3 implementation, um, so when we develop this, you know, we have the ability that we can actually filter on all those things that I was talking about earlier. Um, so you can do the application layer function code filtering. You can look at all your group number, variation, function code, qualifier code, all that fun stuff. So it's a, as I'd call it, like a full protocol implementation. And this is some Belgian slide. So this is about bringing together the OT and IT. So I guess 2015, Belden bought Tripwire. So for the OT side, we're, you know, Tofino, Hirschman, Garrett Com, you know, there's ProSoft, and then Tripwire on the Tripwire side, we're kind of IT. So we're trying to bring together these, um, these companies so we can, you know, come together, which is what Dale's sort of mantra was for this. Cool. So any questions? All right. Thanks, uh, thanks Eric. Uh, are there questions for Eric on this uh, approach? I'd like to ask you about uh, Mike's Mike's on. Mike's on. So first a comment and then a question. <coughs> the comment is, woe to him who has to do this with ICCP. <laughs> ICCP is, I don't know if you've had experience with that, that you could comment on that. Actually, you know, um, I've been asked, but I, to be honest, I, I haven't really looked at that protocol. No, yeah, not. well, we could talk about it over beer. Yeah. On the main stage later. Um, but I'm wondering, um, had you thought about normalizing this? I, I like what you've done. I'm a classically trained systems engineer, so this is a tri pure trade study, right? A trade-off study. Mm -hmm. But you haven't normalized the data. The, um, have you thought about allowing a customer who's creating a, an RFP and doing an evaluation to weight the different pieces so that you can normalize it because some people may care more about one quality versus another. Have you thought about adding that to your? Yeah, well, I was, I, I was kind of trying to touch on, I think one of my points was just about, okay, you know, there's these proprietary protocols or vendor specific ones, you know, for them, they're going to care that your implementation for DNP3 is good versus Modbus if they don't even use. So yeah, I mean, that's, that's a great point. So my hope from this was that you know, we can really, like as a ICS community, come up with some way to kind of gauge this stuff. I mean, obviously, you know, from a business sense, we're competitors, but I think the end goal here is we want to protect these industrial control systems, and really we should all be trying to make the best software we can. Um, so that's kind of my, my hope for that. Other questions? There's one in the back. 
Thanks. So um, I'm curious. Let's. You're, you're talking about Modbus. So um, it's clear that you could have a capability to say, for example, um, block Modbus write register 100. You know, certain ranges, mm -hmm. 100 to 200. Yeah. So that's fine. But what if what? What's your answer if I'm like a process control engineer, and I don't want to think about Modbus. I want to think about this is a pressure vessel, and I don't want it to go over 600 degrees. How do I express that in one of your rules? Right, so I mean, it really translates down to, you know, on the wire, you're going to see it as some Modbus command, some function. He's going to represent it maybe as a tag or some other reference. So in the Tofino's case, we have this idea of test mode. So what you do is you put in test mode, run all your commands, you get a syslog message or an event message saying, you know, it's, it's, it's blocked this specific Modbus function code, this address range. Um, and then they would go about creating rules for that. So it'll permit it in test mode. When you move to operational, you have these rules built. However, it's not going to correlate, you know, this is me looking at this pressure valve, oh, this is Modbus function code X, and so. Well, if I bought the pressure vessel from GE, I would want them to give me the Tofino rules so that when I'm, wor when I'm working on a management console, I can say temperature range as opposed to Modbus functions, which I don't ever want to look at. Yeah, no, that's, I mean, that's a good point. <laughs> yeah.